when he has enterprise plus consulting. So they are bringing in all these different spheres to answer these questions as regards data quality. So um, he's going to put the slide link as well. As you're asking questions, if you have questions that you have, if you're shy to ask your questions, you can just put the questions there. You can also put your questions for them. So the first question would be about data quality. And I'll give that to Mr. Ayodele. Just give us like a brief about the understanding of data quality, what it's all about, and how it's beneficial for us as data professionals. Thank you, okay. sir. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi. All right, so um, data quality basically refers to the quality of data. <laughs> right, um, so that sounds very ambiguous. So let me, let me define it a bit better. So it refers to the quality of data, but we can break it into various dimensions. So when we say quality of data, we can look at completeness. Is the data complete? Are there missing values? Right. We can look at uniqueness. In some cases, your data needs to be unique. For example, if I want to know the total number of customers in a company, if I have records that are duplicates, that gives me you know, wrong, wrong numbers, right? Um, I can also look at it from a validity standpoint. So in a case where you have a column that has ages, if you see ages, so if it's a bank, for example, and you expect that all your customers should be within a certain age for a certain product, so let's say 18 and 60, for example, any value that goes below or above that, that points to a quality issue, right? So you basically, so we can basically break down data quality into those dimensions, and what we're trying to look at is if the data fits properly into those various dimensions. So there's uniqueness, there is a completeness, there's validity, there's also accuracy. So in, in some cases, you can have and because people mix validity and accuracy, and they mix them up. So in some cases, and I have a phone number, the phone number might look valid because, I mean, it's 11 characters, has zero at zero, you know, and follows all those rules. But it might not be accurate because that phone number might, even though Abiyodun gave me the phone number, that might not be his phone number, right? So even though it is valid, it is not accurate because it doesn't belong to him. Right, so we can break down data quality into those dimensions and that helps us understand it you know, a whole lot better. It's really looking at if your data conforms to certain rules, right? And those rules can cut across those dimensions which um, I just mentioned. One last one is timeliness. And the way to think about timeliness is um, yesterday was the end of a month. So you have a lot of organizations building their reports for last month. Right, what they call end of day or end of month. Now, if I have values up until the 28th, that data is not fresh enough, or that data is not timely. I don't know if that makes sense. What I will need is data up until yesterday, which was 31st. Right, so in a case where I have that gap, then there's a quality issue also. So those are the dimensions you can look at it. Um, against, and it's really about does my data conform to all those rules across those dimensions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Iwai. Thank you for mentioning the dimensions, the dimensions of data quality, accuracy, timeliness, validity, and completeness. All right, so the next question I'll ask you good to Mr. Quinn. Um, you, have, you have had experiences both in industry and both in consulting, and then if you actually work with data, you know that data has quality issues. So I'd like to ask you, what are some common sources of data quality issues, and how can organizations address these challenges? Um, so building up on what I did right, uh, said earlier, so from one major, one major source is really from the first system. So first, few make reference to latency, which is the last thing we talked about, is how recent the data is. So the first question is, um, what can cause your data to be latent? So the latency basically means that, oh, your data was supposed to be showing as of, yes, as of this morning, but you're basically still showing as of maybe yesterday or as two days ago. So that could just be um, either an issue from your, your pipeline. When I say pipeline, it says that could be a system you set up on how to move data from one source to another. And that source of data quality, but it majorly could be from source system. So what are my source system? So there are instances where the developers who are called data producers, so developers in this instance are software developers that, that build products, uh, which customers will leverage. 
And um, data people are called data consumers. So he's either a data engineer, he's data analyst, he's data scientist, we are the one that leverages data, right? So most of the time, many of the software developers and many of the data producers don't necessarily know how what you do impacts the data consumer. So which is why a software engineer can just create a new column and then it's possible the new column that you've created, or you even have a column that you have that exists in the, in the source system already, that you built a dashboard up already. But they probably just made a new update on that column without informing you. So all you end up seeing is what happened. You just see that some numbers are not making sense, or you are getting an error that wasn't existing before. But when you do more or less like do a deep dive into the data, you figure out that oh, something has changed from the source system. So, Source system most times really one of the issues that cause data quality, which is why now we are talking about a concept called data contract. I like saying now that we know that a lot of what uh, data producers, who are the software developers, what they are doing in part what we do as data professionals, how can we have what is called an handshake such that there is like a, a contract in code such that any new data, any new column, any new feature, any new schema that they are creating, we are aware ahead of time such that we will not only figure out that something has changed. Only when there's an issue in the dashboard, only when there's some um, abnormality, we know ahead of time how we can mitigate any issue that occur. So that's from uh, the data of data quality. Let's assume the source system is fine, and that thing also is from data governance perspective, which comes to what um, Chiso mentioned, which is data documentation. Now, as as simple as that is, uh, a lot of time. I've had to work on client, um, many client projects where you have a lot of uh, tables all over the places and there are literally no context into what everybody's doing. Everybody's creating new new metrics from different tables along as school. Oh, marketing is creating a revenue. They, they have a few. Uh, sales have their own calculation. So why end up happening? Because when you talk about the data quality, you want to have accuracy that I, talk, that I talked about, which is completeness. Now, if all of these things uh, and not in check when you start having a lot of what's the word a lot of data all over the place and that's what data governance and data documentation are supposed to do. So data governance in this time of data, how do we get to manage how data get consumed? So now we know that data data producers are software developers to talk about the contract, even though yes that is not possible as of now. Not many companies in India are doing it. Maybe none, let's just choose that word. But at least one way we know that oh source system have an issue. Now let's even assume we know we can mitigate that. The next thing is do we have system in place to help us to understand things that are being generated? Oh, we have 10 tables. These are all the tables that are being generated. These are all the units. This is what those tables are powering. Do we have context into all of those things such that even when they have an issue in the dashboard, we can easily understand where the issue is coming from. And those are just areas where issue comes from. So first source system, second is uh, lack of Good data governance in place. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. All right, so you mentioned the stuff around data contracts and um, governance and also uh, documentation. So I'll, I'll give this question to, question to Mr. Fatale. Uh, I would like you to speak on strategies that could help businesses organizations resolve these problems. Because you're coming from a CSU's executive perspective, mirroring between the data technical team and the business background. So how what strategies could be put in place to help us resolve these issues from the sources and all the final as well I think uh, I think um, I mean I'm not gonna speak all this baby English that is speaking, so I'll try to break it down. So the first thing that you have to find is that there's no standard definition of quality. Quality is relative, it depends on the field that you are. So you can't say this is what is quality. For example, oh, the microphone, oh, this is isn't the problem. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, the, the, the hiring of those things that will focus too much on the microphone and the brain will not be able to be able to be. So next time, this is what that. <laughs> so, like I was saying, quality is relative. He works in AIR, I work, I work in the bank, he has a client. He can't say that quality is the same for all of us. For we that we work in the bank, we want your phone number, we want your email address, we want your gender, your location. These are the things that we can know things about. Does that apply to you? Maybe, maybe not. Does that apply to you? Maybe, maybe not. So if you have to, the first thing that you have to establish what a data, uh, what's your data standard? Is when you have a standard, you want to know that quality is high or the quality is low. 
for example, you want to play a basketball team, and you establish that if you are five, six, five, seven, you don't bother. So the quality of the people they are looking about five, ten, and above, people that can actually dunk the ball. So you have to, that's the first, you have to, because if you don't know what you are looking for, you keep running all over the circle. So you have to establish and define, the organization has to define what your data quality standards are. So when you now define what your career uh, was called, your data quality standard, the next thing is now to now start doing validation checks, which you're doing. For example, like he said, you can have 11 digit number, does that mean that it's my number? And that's why validation has to happen. For example, I have my number. So if you're giving a phone, uh, what's it called, a phone number, there should be a validation that checks and send an SMA or uh, SMS and go take it to you. Recall that when you do some certain, you fill some forms online, and you put an email, say they've sent an email to go and validate. You have to go back out of your email and validate that email is correct. So these are the things that you need to do to ensure because quality is not one time thing, it's a continuous thing. And you, it's, like I said, it's a life cycle thing. So after doing that, then you now have to do regular audits. Regular audits is when you now start bringing to like AI, machine learning, and the likes of all the other ones that can actually check. For example, you do a sample check, you say, oh, you say, Okay, is this email correct? Is this the same format of email? Put a sample and send the test sample to find out whether this email is. For example, if you are looking for age, you want to see whether the dates are arranged in standard. It is not American style that the year comes for us and all those things. So you do all those spot checks to see whether it is. Then apart from that, you need to start monit monitoring. You have to now identify those uh, data, uh, those data inputs that is of primary importance to you. So for example, want to be, for example, we work in the bank. If you know that phone number, email, they are very, very important to us. Because with that, the bank can go down or go up. If I mistakenly send his own statement of account to you, this guy can sue me for data breach. Just like there's a doctor in Nigeria who has who's been sued for a ridiculous amount of money for uh, for uh, displays uh, a patient's uh, information online. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, and you can recall that one time when Gary Bale was playing for Real Madrid, he was injured. You know, it's typical and traditional for football clubs to say that uh, this guy is injured, he has an hamstring and he's off three weeks. And the guy said, he, he cannot, that is his private information, that the club cannot announce the extent of his injury and nothing. The reason that I said that he's injured, and that's all, because that's his personal information. So if you go there, you now understand how you need to be a regular test. So what I'm saying is that you pick those ones that matters to you and monitor them regularly. So Ope has touched on the point, it has to be governance. If there are no rules, there are no, uh, what's called, no corporates or no seniors. So you need to understand how people touch your data from the beginning to the end. If, as long as you leave it open, you will be training for the rest of your life. Because if everybody has access to it, somebody can change anything. Yeah. Somebody can come and change all it. So it has to be governance. Governance means a lot. I mean, it's a, it's a total field entirely. So what you need to do in the governance is to say who touches what, and there's a log to know who did what. There's a the governance of who can touch, who cannot touch, what can be exposed, what cannot be exposed. Because anything that you leave in the hands of human beings is a failure point. Mm. Check it. The left Bible, left the land in our hands. You know what we are doing with all these ones. Even and federal capital of Abuja that they written, we still don't understand the interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm saying that you don't allow human wisdom. So as much as possible, use them to guide human beings. Yeah. I think those are the strategies that you have. But like I said, it is not that after you have done it once, it has to be periodic and it can be on the spot. But the basic thing for me, and the primary thing that you need to first define what are your quality standards. If you don't define that, then you don't know what you're looking for. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'll try to pick from, from both sides. All right, so let me start with um, some causes of data quality issues. So I'll first talk about source systems. I'll just try to build on that. I think um, one major issue, especially at the source system level, is when you don't have validation rules. You should be able to validate, which is what, you know, um, what I was talking about. And those validation rules should typically be standards that you set from data governance to say that the phone number must be this, the email must look like this, a name must, you know, and all that. 
if you don't have those validation rules, you typically have quality issues. That's one. Two, your system design, as simple as that sounds, is very important. Because if the system is not designed properly, you find out that you start to also have quality issues. Three, you probably want to train the people who, so you have sales agents and all those types of people. They don't, analytics and data science and all those things, it's an afterthought for them. It's not important to them. What's important to them is I brought the customer, the customer is tied to my name, she came out. So you need to train them to also start to think about the implications of what they are doing, which is what you know, I said to talk about that. What if I send a statement to someone who, that is not their statement, I will get sued, right, as a company. So you want to be able to train people. Now, there's another side that data quality issues can come from, and it's something called data migration. So you have an old system and you want to move to a new system. Typically, the data in the old system has to move to the new system, but sometimes the structures of those systems are different. So you find out that something as simple as maybe a CRM upgrade or moving from one CRM to another CRM can cause issues for you. Let me give you an example. An example is you have the creation date of customer in this system that starts from maybe 2006 when the company was incorporated. And then, by the time you migrate to this other system, this other system in the creation date is only allowing you to record from when this new system started to operate. Yes, that automatically, which is showing 2023, that automatically spoils any analysis you want to do around historical information. Now, it becomes a problem if that old date was not migrated into this new system. <laughs> it almost finished, right? So. Those are some, you know, very common causes of, so, so let me put that aside. Now, the second part, which, you know, um, the I talk about was, you want to do audits. It's very important, you do an audit. But you don't stop at an audit, which is, oh, how am I doing with my audit as of today? Because remember that your audit is just as of today, right? Even if you clean the data, it is still as of today. So you want to also think about, going forward, which is very important, which is where data governance comes in. Okay, let's set rules, let's set standards. Ensure those rules and standards are enforced on the system. If they're not enforced on the system, you've just wasted your time. Because you never can trust human beings. They will always cut corners. Even when rules are enforced on the system, when you said an email must be something at something.com, someone can go and put mail at mail.com. Wow. Yeah, so you must <laughs> so you want to have rules, and you must always be doing those checks because people would always want to be to the system wow. just to do that. So I think I'll just stop. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So um, a lot has been almost everything we've seen has been revolving around that organs, right? So I'd like to go till to that point a bit, but then bring it back home. So most of people here. Uh, really in teams where well, actually they don't they don't really do anything with data governance really. The yeah, data engineer is just uh, sure? I, I'll guess so. They should get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> I'll guess so. Because um, really the data engineer she wants to just make sure that Spider Man is working well. The analyst wants to dish out the report as quickly as possible. Is that what you do? No sir. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. okay. All right. So my, my question is most of the people here now, how would you advise them? At what point do you think they should begin to talk to think about data quality and data governance? Because typically their boss would be like, oh, we need this report. And the analyst is like, oh, I take the report and go, that kind of thing. As well as they start thinking about, okay, we need to start setting rules. And how can they implement this as a data engineer or data analyst? Really right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, so first, I probably would speak first as a loan dealer to him and also like, in a same perspective, because I know if there's one experience, I know many people in the Nigerian data ecosystems, most people probably work at the loan data team. Either you're the only one, well, if you're lucky enough to work in a structured organization like Bumi, ARM, and, and the likes of have team, most likely you have structure in place already. So if you are probably like a loan data team, or probably are just two, most of them that are known, you will probably will have um, C executives who are not data literate as well. Yes, they know that there are some value they could get from data, right? And um, how to get those values, so that's why we are provided to get to do those things. I give you a bit of perspective. When I joined CarryWise, 
I was the only data person, the first actually. Now, my CEO, my CTO, even the developers, they knew that, oh yes, this guy is coming, data, data, everybody has been hearing about data, right? But now the question is, I was born as a data scientist actually, even though I, I ended up doing data engineering. So, that aside, now how then was I able to pass a lot of things? The first thing is, which is ability to really do a lot of data literacy, data education. Now, if you are in that side that you usually in an organization that you don't have uh, team and structure, so you have to be the one to set all of those rules in place. And in order to set those rules, that means you need to understand what you are doing to be able to communicate the impact of what you want to do to the right people. So how, how do I come about that? I designed a documentation, did a lot, couple of presentations to my CEO, my CTO, and the tech lead, letting them know the impact of everything they are doing and what I need to do and how it's going to affect what uh, the value you want to get. Now, it took a lot of back and forth, but I was able to basically express myself and I was able to get a buy-in. So as a result of that buy-in, now the software developers know that before you do anything, you have to have a bit of documentation, let me know what is happening, and all of those things. So that way I can enact any, any form of rules that I want to do from that side of things. Now, but if you are in a structured team, obviously you won't have to go through all of those things. That's why you have the head of data and all of those things to, to build all of those um, those nuances around how do we set rules, who are people that need to see some kind of dashboard and all of those things. So those are the conversations that you will be having, not necessarily you who is like a team member, but if you are the only sole so person, trust me, those are the kind of conversation you will have. Start having a conversation, what are the things that matter to different departments, based on that, who need to see what, and those are the kind of conversation you would have, which is called business gathering or business requirements. Because at that stage, you understand all the value that needs to go to different departments, and based on that, you know how to segment all of those rules. Yes, it may not be the technical thing you think you want to do, which is, let me just build my pipeline, write all my models, build, build my dashboard. But as simple as those things are, they may not be technical, but trust me, they basically have a lot of impact on the value they are doing, because if the source system uh, have a lot of issues. Trust me, when the CEO see them, some number doesn't make sense, the pressure come back to you to find why some numbers are not making sense. So which is why if you are a loan data team or you have a LinkedIn, you need to find a way to get the buying from your stakeholders. They won't know this thing, so you would have to be the one to do a lot of education, not just on the sales executive, but also from those that leverage your data, which is what I already talked about, which is you have to do the training. I've had to hold a lot of training for my for folks in marketing, for folks in growth, let them know how you consume my data and how you use something. So I should make my work much easier. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here. What is, do you want to say something to that? Um, okay. All right, thank you so much. All right, so I'm going to move to the next question to Mr. Fatai in line with this conversation. Yes. He said it's better to get stakeholders by me. Um, so the question is, it's just at the top of it. I would, I would like you to, to tell us the import of having soft skills and communication skills. Because data quality code, it code doesn't look like your really technical skill, but then it's very, very it's valuable to the quality of data. So just like to emphasize the importance of us beyond building our SQL skills, building all the technical skills, it's important for you to get that communication skill right so you can buy it. I think naturally I shall put a question to you that is anything that you do this board that doesn't involve communication. You know what? I was always always tell them in the office that uh, you guys know all the technical details. So I'm going to be richer than anyone would be. <laughs> Several times I've shown it to them. And you know what? They will develop a product, they cannot sell it to me. That same product, I will sell it to them. They plan for me. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know what they are doing. I don't know what they built. I don't know. They by the way they are explaining to me, presenting it, uh, the whole thing to me, I will tell them, you, let's, let's reverse it. You end up talking for me. I hear what, because I have tried to understand that no matter what you do, your ability for you to break it down to the next person or the audience is one of the subject. Audience or the people that you want, if you are not interested, I was having a fire chat conversation with a young lady, and this was the bit of a conversation. Often than not, Techie people are this air of arrogance. I know all the animal language, the Python, the Cobra, some of them are the file. They are they are they are they are too they are too arrogant. 
So when you when they walk into a meeting, they assume that everybody has the same level of knowledge with them. They'll be talking about the parts and the data set. I'm not interested in all those ones. But there's what they call storytelling with data. And I and always, I mean, that's the first thing I always tell people. You need to know how to do the story. That's one of my, uh, one of the guys that worked with me. That was an article yesterday that, I mean, coincidentally, I was at his retreat. And I was saying that I don't have anything to tell you, technical guys. The only thing I just want to tell you guys is that you need to know how to tell the story with your data. And he was like, okay. So he now went, you know, he went to go and present uh, something that they've done, which was fantastic, to business. And business is not rejected it outright because they were not communicating with the business. And that's where communication comes in. Communication is that you've done all your own field of work, your data set, whatever it is that you want to go. You have to break it down and translate it in a manner that people who are not interested in your animal language, in your model, that they can understand. When Microsoft is selling, uh, what do you call it? The, the people that build ChatGPT, they're not telling you anything any, any, any in algorithm. They're saying, look, your life is going to be easier. Just type this and get your answer. Is there anything apart from that they're telling you? So, in other things that how you get people, how you involve some thoughts in people, and it's not through your technical language. So, there's what they call you building something, there's other one to you making it to sell. The last man is where the money is, not in building. Anybody can build, but not everybody can sell it. If, you, if you're very good at building, building, you cannot, have, you, have you, has anybody ever watched? And my Apple, when they are launching their product, it's like the whole world wants to know. Not because of the product, it's the way it has, when, when Steve Jobs was alive, Tim Cooks are taking it to the next level. And Apple does not do adverts. That one, that opening is what everybody used to drive by Apple 15, Apple 14. Especially in Nigeria that we don't think. We just go and buy more. So what I'm saying is that communication is as it's good in normal real life, it's essential in the data world. Because again, we on the data world always, you know, we are big clouded and we are heavy with thoughts about our technical details. They're not interested. I said, what is so happened to you to tell you that that's microchip, this is, they're not telling you. They're just telling you this is it. They will not show you one picture before I know that. I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Samsung uh, 23 Ultra. What are you using 23 Ultra? It's not the picture. Did they tell you anything about the picture resolution? They just tell you this is one of that cameras that it's only one day. Oh, I'm buying that phone. So you have to break it down. So that communication means that you need to carry your table. Often than not, we in the technical world, we don't have money. It's the other people that will fund that your model. And you need to sell the business value. And that is where it matters most. It is not the technical capability or the technical build that you want to sell. We do that mistake a lot. We say that you need where, what's it called? You need cloud, you need rain, you need all these things. They are not. You need to come with that business value to them first. When I started out as the team leader of the Sterling Bank, of course, it was a new field. There was nobody in the industry anywhere that was doing data. Of course, people have been focused on data. They don't know what data is all about. But in the dedicated office, so the first conversation is like, oh, you want to sell data to people. People are not going to listen to you. So you know what I told them? They gave me a mind that, okay, I just didn't know what I I just asked somebody, said, what, is, what is the performance of your team? He said, no, I have to call FinCon. I said, that, who, was, who, is your, uh, who is your best staff? He said, I have to call HR. Mm -hmm. I said, do you know that I can give you something that you can check right there and there? Mm -hmm. I said, what is that? That is how you communicate. Immediately, I said that. We're like, what can you do? Simple power BI. <laughs> just show them. I said, look, say, oh, how can I get it? I said, I can make it appear on your phone. So on the go. So everyone, you know, that create, created interest so they can listen to me. But if I come down there, you want to do data, data is uh, the scripting, the scripting is like <laughs> <laughs> You just find out like, people just depressing their phone. <laughs> so communication, you have to understand your audience. Because communication is a skill. And it's one of those soft skills. Because when people come for interview, you see people that on the surface, they would have highly recommended. We were doing a parent child of advising a young lady. People will come and they know this job. Just imagine, you went to school, I mean, you went to school, primary primary school, secondary school, university, and that one that wasted our time, one and a half years, NYC, whatever, you need that one, you come back, and somebody is now testing you for 10 minutes. 
your BSc, and you see this ten minutes interview, you go on and ten minutes after interview, that means you are good, or the person is jobless. <laughs> so just imagine what's going to happen there. Is your communication skill that matters? So just look at the summary of everything you have done. It boils down to that to So I replace anything, you just have to be intentional and you have to be deliberate on how you communicate things across. Like I was always like I was telling the same young lady that we're talking about, one of your acid acid tests is that when you build something, do not share it with all these data people. Because you will speak in your language. Well, find somebody who doesn't understand that data. And I said that mommy, go and meet your parents. You'll be the dashboard. Say what's the dashboard? Then you know you're in trouble. <laughs> so if you can get past them, then it gives you understanding that oh, this is how to solve. Try it. All you guys are building uh, DBT, DBT, go. Tell your brother, okay, I have to explain DBT to you. Then you don't learn how to communicate very well. I think I'll drop it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to take the last question from Mr. EY. And so if you have questions, I can take questions after now. And then the question is between one, between one question. <laughs> Just <laughs> together. So first, it's about metadata. Uh, so one of the ways we can check quality will be through data or data. As for us as professional data data. That's one. Um, how we can integrate that. Number two, be in line with that, what metrics um, would be great to measure at the start to check your quality or assess your quality. And then thirdly, in the rise of AI, um, how can we leverage AI for data quality in our organizations? Um, I think yesterday I was watching an NVIDIA conference. You know, they, they are the power is for AI and all that. And I was like, wow, well, chat GPT is like the almost the basis of what's going on. So how can we leverage AI? Okay. Uh, help me again. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> metadata. metadata. Metrics that we can measure is metadata and okay. use of AI for Okay, so um, let me start with the metrics because that will be easier. Okay, so I, I will write on something that I said earlier. Each organization needs to define what quality is to them. And the way to do that is to identify something called your critical data elements. The truth about it is, there's a lot of data in every organization, but not everything is as important as you know the other one. Uh, if you look at your customer data, in some CRMs you can have up to 500 fields, but not all the 500 are important. It might just be two, phone number, email. So you, that, that's the first thing you want to do. Which ones are the most critical? And how do I identify criticality? What's the business value? How do I identify criticality? Regulations. In some cases, regulations will mandate that you collect some information. If not, you'll be fined. Right? So it's either I'm looking at regulations or I'm looking at this thing is going to help me sell better to my customers, understand my customers better. And so I identify my critical data elements. That's the first step. Now, the second step for metrics is you can still use those dimensions I talked about earlier. You can add to it, you can remove from it, to be honest. In some cases, it will apply. In some cases, it won't apply. So you want to think about completeness, you want to think about uniqueness, you know, all those dimensions. So based on those dimensions, you can then profile your data, right? Or what you call an audit. So when you do that audit, what you are looking for is something they call a data quality index. And what is a data quality index? A data quality index is just very simple. How many of these records are in line with the rule, right? And how many of them are not in line with the rule? So what's the percentage of the ones that are in line with the rule over the total? Now, what that helps you to do, and you can do that at a field level and record level, and I'll explain. So I can look at all my emails and say how many emails follow this particular rule. If there are 100 emails, maybe just five or 10. So if it's 10% of my emails are good quality, 90% are bad quality. I mean, that can help you start to have conversations with the business. Now, it's always very important that you also tie the quality issues to either regulatory fines or what the business is missing from a business value perspective. I don't know if that makes sense. So you want to do it at a field level. You can also do it at a record level. So I'm looking at a customer holistically, and I'm looking at all the fields that are compulsory, and I'm saying of all my customers, I only have 10% of customers having their data complete. Does that make sense? So that's 
a data quality index that you might want to use. Um, what's the last question? AI. Yeah. AI, okay. So where I think AI can, can help out is with, with the ongoing checks that you want to do, right? Because um, at some point, you can start to have anomalies. So you've been having this particular trend over time, and then all of a sudden, you have a spike, right? Um, sometimes it might be difficult to monitor that manually, right? So you might need some form of model, or some form of system that leverages AI that will do that detection and automatically spot you know, uh, those anomalies for you and show you the anomalies such that it's not every day you're having, because if you're having to check every day, one day you forget or one day you get tired. But if you have something that automatically helps you to check where the anomaly is, then I mean, uh, that will solve your problem. I hope that answers the question. There are even tools, there are even tools available when, uh, that are talking about data observability, things like MetaPlane, does that for you, leverage AI actually, so which means you don't have to start bothering yourself with this. Alright, so um, does anybody have any question before I take you on the screen? Yeah, I know there's one question, but does anybody have any question? Does anybody have any question? No question. No, 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 what's that? What's that? This question, no, no. Alright. So Dika, I'll come to you. Let's let's hear from you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Simi. I want to ask about data contracts. Have you documented anything for contracts between you as a software engineers? What are the most important structure you need to put in place for creating data contracts? Thank you. So to speak to that, and interestingly, I actually didn't even know the whole idea of data contract probably started last year through this guy called Chad, right? So I didn't even know, even though he had had like a documentation that I did. So it was when the whole buzzword around data contract started last year, like it's not like a big thing, right? Even though that goes more into building an API relating to that. But now what I did while at Cario, I was basically, I had like a template, of all the different tables that I leverage. So I have all those documentation that the software developers also have uh, access to. So I use a tool called Coda. You can also use Notion, which is also a good documentation tool. So based on that, all I just needed to do, even though yeah, this happened towards the end of the project I did, but now based on that, all I just needed to do was tell the software, the lead software engineers, and also have a conversation with the CTU, letting them know for every new field and every new table that needs to be created, it should, as much as possible, populate that, ta um, that table. So that table basically will show the name of the table, the new field that has been added, and every other thing. So based on my own data limit that I have in DDT, which Chiso mentioned, so if it's a table that I spy my dashboard, I know exactly how it's going to affect me. Do you understand? So that just gives me a bit of overview. So for any new table that I get, even though yes, it took a bit of time for them to adopt it, even though I don't know if they are still leveraging it now because I'm not there. But the whole idea was basically to just have a, bit, a, a way to uh, see how new tables get created, how new fields get created. Even though now, the old data contract now is now like a big thing where um, a lot of conversation can go around that, which I think still sits under data governance. If, I'm, if I want to look at things, I think it kind of still sits around data governance. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, so can anyone? One no, 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 I just want to break it down so that okay. I think a lot of people are quite okay. still high. I'm quite high, it's a bit too high. So what is a data contract? People are looking at one field of storage or something like that. So what is basically saying that I just want us to agree on how we work together. It's not something that we have social contracts. Some people have been up contracts. We are getting married. But this is how we be. Once we fight, whatever you have is your own. Whatever I have is my own. But once we fight, half of what you have are taken. So that's what that's a contract. What he's saying is that so that we can have an harmonious relationship. It's just like let me give an example, it's just like a bricklayer and the person that molds the what's it called? A molding block. You know, they get supplied for cement and sharp sand. So the guy is saying that for this kind of block, I want this kind of sharp sand. Always give me this kind of sharp sand. You that you're supplying my cement, I want Dangote cement only. 
It's you that you're going to mix for me. Mix, I still remember this building as well. One, one, and you have three, or one, three, six mix. That's concrete. One, one, and you have, you know, that kind of a mix. So I'm saying that so that the output, my block, will be very good. So it's a contract, it's an agreement, a memorandum of understanding, an operation, operating mo module between me and you, how we work. That's what you're trying to say. Right. Much out of the year because I have a controversial this thing about contracts. So contracts are good, but they are not scalable as, as far as I'm concerned. And, and I'll explain. Uh, so if if it's a startup, I mean, yes, it's, it probably will work. But when you look at enterprises, it becomes very difficult. Um, in an enterprise, you can have and this is me probably being conservative, let's say 15, 20 core systems, right, or more. Yeah, that's why I say conservative. Let's even say core, right? Sometimes you have 100, right? But let's say the ones that are most important, maybe 20, um, you would be, you run into issues because you have to be meeting with each and everything. It's not scalable. So, but what you might want to do is maybe look at the top one, so like, okay, let's say it's a bank, there's a mobile app, obviously the in-house software devs, so that's, it's a quick win. But in case where it's a Microsoft system, it's a Microsoft vendor that is deploying it, <laughs> most likely, I mean, you can have conversations, but it's not going to be an official contract, nobody's gonna answer you, right? So, I, I, um, and I think it was Ben stance that I read that, you know, argued about this and, and I felt it made sense. So you might want to have contracts for those, you know, maybe one or two that are the most critical. And then for the rest, you can just have your rules, your automated rules, right? Either in Python, SQL, whatever you want to use, based on what you want to see per column and what you think each one should contain, right? Such that uh, whenever there are any, uh, anomalies that come up, right? You can easily um, resolve them. Now, that's where data governance actually helps because with data governance, what it means is, because it's beyond the, it's beyond the, um, the policies and the standards, with data governance, you actually have rules and responsibilities, right? So people are accountable for certain things and you can hold them, the organization can hold them, right? So in those kind of cases, when you flag those type of issues, there's someone you can actually hold responsible, or the organization holds responsible, and you can then have a conversation to say, you know, you don't expect this to happen again. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Or all those your rules can be documented into like a data governance framework that can guide a lot of your data governance conversations. But in terms of contracts, you can't scale it across too many systems at the same time, except it's a startup. All right, thank you very much. All right, I, I, I'll come to you. Peter, I'll come to you as well. So I'm going to um, the second question on your side. Yes, I will answer your question. I will answer your question. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> um, he has a has the answer for that. So I'm going to give this second question to Mr. EY. If you're recruiting, if you're recruiting, what do you look out for that will be an SXPT? The reason I'm going to answer, give you that question because yesterday okay. someone um, called me, who I just said, email. She said she put that bit in your team and you only got the job. <laughs> <laughs> she even added that. <laughs> it was because you had somebody already. And I'm like, no. <laughs> so I would like you to, to, to tell us what to call this. So um, what, what are things I look out for? So it depends. It depends on the role, to be honest. Uh, in some roles, um, you are looking for someone that can hit the ground running. Right, so sometimes the technical skills might be very important in that type of role, right? And you know that, okay, the domain knowledge, in three, four months, you can get this person up to speed, right? So in those kind of cases, you're looking at how strong is this person technically and, and how passionate is this person? So a question, and let me not give myself a minute, but there are some questions I ask, and other interviewers on the call will wonder why did you ask that question, but I'm targeting something because I know that that thing tells me how passionate you are, right? And I know that if you are passionate, you most likely, for the domain knowledge side, you most likely be doing a lot of reading. And because you're doing a lot of reading, 
you get up to speed very quickly, right? So, again, um, it depends on the role. Sometimes, I mean, if it's a junior role, it's really passion, it's passion. And how I measure passion is, what have you done? Because everybody can come here and say, I'm passionate. But you see, how do I measure that? But if I look at what you've done, I'm able to tell whether you're actually passionate or not. Right, so it's a lot of things. But you see, the thing about interviews is there's a lot that goes into interviews. The fact that an interview went well does not mean you'll get the job. There are too many things. So because remember that, as they're interviewing you, they're interviewing like five other people or six other people, you get. So there are a lot of things to look at. Sometimes it might be the type of experience this other person has. Sometimes it might be, oh, we have this particular system in house, and this person seems to have, even if it was just three months, that this person worked on it. So all of you might have done well almost at the same level, but you find out that there are different things. Another thing might be, there's something HR calls flight risk, right? And some of you might not know that, but flight risk means you're in this company today, six months later, you move to this other company, six months later. And for people with flight risk, what you don't know is that you keep hiring managers, headache. Because for me to be able to go ahead with it, HR is going to grill me and question me a whole lot. So I have to also be sure that I want to give you a chance. Right? So it's a lot of things. And like I said, sometimes it's not that you did do an in interview, it's just that several other things, you know, might have been factored into the scoring and that, that's what is being with that. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, sorry, I think you're just being too nice to be <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you're recruiting, what would you look at for to be an asset to the team? I don't look for anything. When you do an interview, it is you that controls the interview. If you don't tell me your name, I don't know what you do. If you don't tell me your experience, I don't know. See, often than you know, people, I mean, these are experience, I've been telling people for some years now. I can tell you between a range of 60 to 70, or no, between 70 to 80% people that come for interview are never prepared. I can tell you for a fact. And I'll, it starts from this simple question. Tell me about yourself. People will see this to me. My name is this. Of course, I know your name. If I don't know your name, I'm not thinking here. Uh, I went to this school. If you, do, if you don't go to that school, you're not having this kind of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want you to understand is that the stats matters a lot. And I always use this example for everybody. Just imagine you are, I mean, your generation is where from my own generation. In our generation, you have to be articulate, you have to communicate well to ask a meeting out. You know, these days I just buy one as you. <laughs> so let's go back to my walk. Let's go back to my walk. So somebody's going to come to you as a lady. The first word matters to you. Big alpha. You're like, I mean, it's a closed door. That's how you guys come. Somebody's telling you, tell me about yourself. I was born. You to say you're like, okay, 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 okay. So a lot of people are not prepared. And one of the best things I ever put in order they work is Google, ChatGPT, whatever, where you can just find how to how to answer top interview question. What is my name? How to do that? But when you guys come and ask me what is your name, they're reading everything to me. I might be like, does it get have sense at all? So all are, so those are the things. Then secondly, people do not know how to sell their strength. So you have to you have to bring your best foot forward. What is unique about me? What is, what, what is that thing about me that I feel? For example, I went to one interview, uh, I went to one interview around 2015 or about, and they were asking me what, uh, uh, I said who I am. And I said, and I said um, I'm someone who knows little of everything, which makes me stand above everybody. I'm like, what is it about that? I said, yes, I've done operations from the roof, I've done uh, operations strategy, I've done strategy itself, I've done project, man uh, project management, I've worked in technology, and I'm managing event and operation. That kind of skills is very rare, and I have all of them. And I've been able to work with three EDs who are now enemies of the bank, so I know what senior management thinks about. Go to your employer. 
<laughs> so those are the little things that people don't know. It's, 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 it is not, I don't know you. You are going to tell me who you are. You have to sell yourself to me. You've seen people on the, on the face of it, they're very good. And when it comes to interview, the interviewers are talking to so many people. So what we constantly do is to evaluate the last person that is or the person that left the job. The person that left the role that you want to take becomes a standard. Or the last person that you spoke with becomes a standard. So what do you bring to the table? People are physical and data analysis. Who knows that? What is that? So if you see, if I say that, uh, what would you look for? You add your asset. Sell yourself to me. Make the decision difficult for me to reject you. So apart from that, you are talking about a uh, big passionate. You have, to, uh, yeah, you have to exhibit intelligence. Is there any question that you must answer? I've never answered all questions in an interview before. I could answer, I don't know. But I want to know. But when I see people feel that I must answer questions, it's not really like so, and some people again, the energy that they bring to the table. You were there when we interview somebody. What did I say? This guy, this person, energy is low. I've not even loaded you with work. You were there earlier now. I said, I'm standing up. I said, What? I mean, this guy has not even walked eight to five. He has not walked over nine. Just have a conversation with guys like Those are body languages. So aside body as I'm just telling the one that is not even. So those are the see, All of them know what I'm talking about. Okay, knows we are that is someone like, yeah, I can do bikes. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're not good, but that's what you give it me, and that's what I'm going to evaluate you on. Yeah. And I see some people, all they are interested in is money. I'm on, I'm on. This guy is not interested in working with me because when I see that you like money, I'm not discuss with you. Wow. I am serious. I'm giving you from the real part. I interview people, I don't think your knowledge, your skill is the last thing I said, is the last thing I want to do. I want to see somebody who's credible. There's some people, they are just unbendable. <laughs> I've seen someone, very good guy. I was not like, you know what? All these your open source tools is not going to happen when you come and meet me. I mean, I work in a Microsoft certified environment. You are going to work with Microsoft tools. I say, ah, Microsoft Teams tools are rubbish. This is it. I heard the issue. The person, one of the panelists used to be an ex-Microsoft person. Like, okay. So I was like, okay, you rubbish what we are using. Okay, ah. I want to come and work with them. So at the end of the day, anything that you cannot defend, do not open your own and say it. Like I said, the, most, the major source of failure is that people do not prepare. Your preparation starts only when you get that offer for uh, what's called letter of interview. That is your failure uh, failure point. At this my level, I still, even though I'm not looking for jobs, I still try to check myself, okay, what if I interview? Because when interview is going to come, the highest they can give you is for data hours. Yeah. Nobody's going to say one week, and it's deliberate. So they're going to say, oh, you have been invited to have a meeting. Is it that time you want to go and prepare and start doing your pitch? Who am I? You must have been in your head. Yeah. Then do a bit study about the road itself. Ask questions. One of the things that when you ask people, okay, can you ask those questions? Say, how much are you going to pay the world? You ask the exact question. What kind of person are you looking for in that role? So you're not like, okay, or what is this role tied to the overall objective of the plan? Then I'm going to get thinking. So it's not about that first class, first class for who? Sit down and that you like. <laughs> so those are the things that you guys need to do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so we are one hour behind because we started 30 minutes late. There's a lady that will fight you, you don't call her. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a question. So I just want to know how many people have questions. Yeah, we'll take a few on the board, don't worry. I mean, apart from Vika and Lady, that's all. That's all. Right, well, so if you're hungry, there's freshmen on the right. So I'm going to give Victor now. Then we so say you just take your question, take your question, and then you will answer, and then we take the two questions there and then we go. Good afternoon. So my question is in line with communication. Um, just the same way we talked about data quality being um, a continuous process, right? Um, I also think communication uh, needs to really be a continuous process. I'm, I'm asking this question um, based on 
my own experience too. Um, how do we maintain communication in a way that um, you discuss X with management today, um, you got buying today, but because businesses are dynamic, um, by next week, what management is thinking about might have moved away from what you talked about last week. So if your discussion was on number one today, next week it's on number two. Um, without that con continuation or that continuity, um, it, it keeps slipping down and there just really has to be a way um, to make sure that whatever you're communicating about with respect to data, um, how do we make sure that this keeps being top of mind um, to management? I'm sure you have experience that can speak to that. Um, thank you very much. Okay, I will start. Okay, let them take it. Forget me, I think they can move out. I think the can you hear me? I think the simple way from all the experience is that you have to make your case a compelling one. And I always like to use the example. If you go and see your doctor and you do your annual medical report, and it tells you that um, if you don't take time, you probably have stroke. There's no way you want to prioritize that thing because I told you that if you don't do this thing, you're going to die soon. So again, it depends on how you make this uh, case to him. For example, there's one time I had a, we were having a conversation about when GDPR just came in. Fine, he has not got it to NDPR or that time GDPR. So I just told them, hey, boss, there's this GDPR, I so said, you come here. I said, there's nothing. I don't want to do that. If you don't do this thing, and one of our customers who have, uh, who, uh, who is with two international passport, gets stopped in Europe and flat, they will take 2% of the balance. I said, why? <laughs> I said, 2% ah, of the balance for what? I said, okay, look at it. I said, okay, what do we do? That's how you build a compelling case. I'm not going to go and say, we need to do GDPR, data governance, stuff and like, I said, 2% will go. You see, I learned that often than not that you bring the hand from the beginning. As, man, as senior management, they have short attention span because they are dealing with multiple people, regulator, customer, everybody. So it is you, how you bring your own compelling case that can make your own case proper priority. And like, again, it's, it's all happened about this storytelling and communication, how you communicate. For the guys here, ask all of them, am I being recorded? Yes, sir. Anyway, that's it. Just ask any of the guys. If I say, how are you? The guy may not respond. I'm pregnant. The guy's like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to say? Look, is that you make yourself? You check out the guy here, they're laughing. If they get any of that message, they want me to cough like, ah, why? Bala. So how is how you build that compelling case? And often than not, you have to make people understand the cost of not doing what you have to do. And that's where the value comes from. I've not seen anything. If you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. And when you, I, I, you have to be able to quantify it, not qualify. Qualify will just be a motion of the right? No, no, no. You quantify it now and cover. It's just always that you don't have CCTV in the house, you can get robbed. But with this CCTV, you will know who wants to rob you and they still got that. And this will uh, save you. Like, oh, and this man, since we're coming to his I saw them and couple of this. So you have to build the cost of not doing that particular job. Put that on the work for him. And he can testify to it. It's the cost of not doing that. Yeah, I will come and tell you. Because benefit sounds like uh, Davido's music or whiskey you know, music. The cost of not doing always trigger the reaction. All right. Yeah, yeah just, just, just a quick add. And I think that before you start any of your projects, you need to so have. So, oh, okay. so as a, actually, I'd like you to take his question, which will be the last one. Someone looking, looking to transit to a lead role, what would you recommend? So a lead role, yes. A lead data role, yes. Okay, so this is what, what I'm saying, yes. uh, pattern. So you need to always think about the outcomes. And when I say outcomes, a, a flashy uh, machine learning model is not an outcome. A wonderful, beautiful, aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing part here at that for is not an outcome. An outcome is what the business considers value. So you're bringing in more customers, you're increasing revenue, you're reducing costs, customers are better satisfied, all those type of things, those are outcomes. So whatever you're doing, you need to find ways to tie it to all those outcomes, right? And like you said, maybe instead of looking at it from a benefit perspective, 
and say, oh, you start to gain five billion something from this. You can say, you start to lose five billion from this. The truth about it is, the minute you start to put that in front of stakeholders, they will most likely prioritize what you're saying. But the minute the, and this is something I've noticed, a lot of times, some data projects are qualitatively beneficial. So you have a team saying, oh yes, the data team has been doing well. Yes, that dashboard is, is good. But by the time you get to budget team, and you're saying you need more Power BI licenses, or you need to go to cloud, everybody's going to say no. That's why, why are we spending more money on this? Why? Because from a qualitative perspective, it makes sense. But you must be able to quantify it. The minute you're able to now say, I'm bringing in, based on all the projects I've done, this is how much I brought in. And they can see that the cost of the Power BI license or the uh, cloud solution is just 5% or 10% of what you brought in. There will be no agreement. Thank you. So for someone transiting into a lead role, that's how you need to be thinking. That's how you need to think. Let's calm down with time. We take two and a half to start this. So no need to rush. Oh, this is right. Sterling Cafe One. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, thank you so much. You have to answer the question. I want to answer the question. Translate to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, no, no. I think I think I didn't ask one of you. Somebody translated the big data role. Yes. So there's just one advice. Okay. okay. So if you are translating to a lead, uh, a, 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 a lead data role, a lead data role. So the only thing I advice I tell you that your technical skill start becoming irrelevant. Your people skill, your stakeholders engagement, your communication, your ability to translate um, technology into business value is what you need at that point in time. Often than not, you see people in a big technical role and they are still telling them to go and check with their world. There's a technical person, nobody's going to pay you. Because as a leader, you are supposed to be strategic and use the resources. That those are the people reporting to you to achieve the bank's objectives. And that's as you need to your soft skills, your ability to interpret uh, the mission, the vision, and translate it, ability to get your team behind you. So as a leader, so it's more of a managerial thing. So my advice would be for you to start learning things about managing people, managerial capability. Thank you so much, Jetsi. So I'm going to take a question now. into the data and data analysis industry and um, do you advise the person to do data I mean um, go, um, data governance do you advise the person to just do to just move straight to data governance or the person should do data analysis power bi um, excel Tableau, SQL, Python, before uh, I'm going to just transition to data governance. My second question is this, because me, me especially me, I've been in sales and customer service for the past six years. So I want to transition to data analysis, and most of the jobs I've been seeing, they're going for experience, experience, experience. And me, I just have like seven months experience in the data analysis field. Do I need to lie? <laughs> Do I need to lie in my CV that I have done because somebody because when I was asking I asked somebody that also transitioned and she said she lied on her CV to get the job. So it's still on that job. Do I so that's why I'm asking that. Do I need to lie? For my past experience, that that okay, I was I did this, I did that, I did that too. That's my question. They were just like, ah, but that's reality. Okay. Yes. Okay. Please. So we can tie that to that first question about about the first data job. Oh, okay. So to your question, the second one, so the reality which many don't, many people are trying to transition is how to transition to data. Now, one thing you should realize is, as a result of explosion in data awareness, organizations are now realizing that now you can have a demarcation, what is called citizen analyst. So now, 
you don't have to fully transition away the cap of a data analyst. So what do I mean as a citizen analyst? So a citizen analyst is just, you are the salesperson, you are the finance person, hard on to a data skill, still doing your core stuff. Now, you can transition fully into data where you learn all the X skill and all of those things. But the reality is this, if you have someone that probably has zero experience, that just have all the technical stuff, and you as a salesperson, your sales experience, you have an hard on as a citizen analyst, the truth is you are more valuable than that other guy. Even though that other guy has the technical skill, you have that domain experience which the other guy doesn't have. So which is why I tell people, if you are coming from a previous experience, right, trust me, it's not 100% irrelevant. So you don't have to say you did those your six year experience and now start competing with someone that just finished from uni that has zero experience and all. It could be challenging, right? So what I would advise is, don't see it as you want to lie uh, that your experience doesn't matter. See it as more as you want to transition as a citizen analyst. So what do I mean? Have it from your current role. Learn all the necessary fundamental data skills that you need as a citizen analyst. Things like Excel, things like storytelling with RBI. You can even use Excel. But the truth is, when you learn those skills, you don't have to go into the Python, you don't have to go into the skill actually. When you learn Excel well for analytics, you probably learn a visualization too. Even on your CV, you can revamp it that you are actually a sales analyst or a salesperson with data skill. So that way, you are not looking out for entry level data analyst role. You can actually be looking out, even there are some sales role that probably you can picture, even there are some data role that require experience, but however, you are coming from a domain expertise. So I don't want you to see it as, oh, I have to lie, or I'm. Um, um, throwing away all my years of experience because I want to start this. So see it more like, oh, I want to have a data skill to what I'm currently doing. Because the reality is, not many people really enjoy the core technical stuff. I have people that will say, I love my finance and accounting stuff. I don't think I want to do all this job. I just need the data skill I need to learn to be more productive and enjoy the job that I do. And as much as possible, okay, I just want to value those kind of people more than just a technical guy and all of those. So, I think you just have like a paradigm mindset shift that you don't have to. So when you've learned all of those skill sets, then you cannot find a way to revamp the CV and just infuse those data skills that you've learned, leveraging some of the things you've learned on the job that you're currently doing as a sales rep. Because as much as possible, you have data that you leverage. So those are those are the case study or projects you can talk about in an interview. Because that would mean that yes, you're a sales person, you got a lot of sales data. You are analyzing your own data yourself, and you're not just talking about fictitious data that most people that are learning will leverage. You are talking about real data that you are actually working on, and that become a project portfolio yourself that you can present in an interview. So you don't have to look outside from the unknown. Look from the known, which is where you're going every day at the moment. I don't need that help. Landing your first job, which is almost similar. Okay, so to the first job. So in all honesty, I used to talk, I think I, I know I, I wrote a LinkedIn post on this. There are no rules to it. Just to tell you that. And that is also let you know is the fact that you are it's your first job, you get tons of rejection. So some people might get it in three months, some you get it in six months. I got my first that job eighteen months after learning. So and I was getting tons of rejection back to back. So which means, just have it at the back of your mind that getting that first job is going to be a lot of hassle because you're going to do a lot of work. But now what should you do while you're preparing to land that first job? So I tell people, before you start even looking for a job, I really said something about having some things in place. I see some people start saying, oh, they are applying for a job. You don't have a portfolio. How then will anybody take you serious? Right, so that's the first thing. So if you have all of those check in place, you have a project portfolio that actually showcase your enthusiasm, that actually showcase the skill set that you've alighted on your resume. Don't just say you finish Google Data Analytics. Oh, trust me, nobody cares. The matter of you are done with Google Data Analytics, what project have you worked on? So if you already have a project portfolio, either a Git uh, a GitHub uh, uh, page or a motion page that has all your project portfolio or whatever, whatever repository you want to leverage. Have like three, four of them on each of the skill sets that you claim you know. Say, okay, fine, you've learned SQL. What kind of problem have you solved? You've learned Power BI, what are projects that you have available? And all of those things. So when you have that available, the next thing will be fine. 
let them start applying for job. So don't even dab in to say you want to start applying for job when you've not even fixed that aspect of having a project portfolio, right? So once you have a project portfolio, the next thing is you want to first thing the easier way is join the community. Trust me, as much as, as possible, there are a lot of jobs, most entry level jobs and all of those that have best uh, gotten through referrals. I know many jobs that I've referred, most companies will reach out to me, help me to look for somebody because as much as they know that many people claim to be data analysts, but they don't know anything. So they will trust experienced folks to help them recommend. So it will be easy for anybody to recommend you when you are in the community and you are active, See. right? When any recruiter reach out to me that they are looking for junior data analysts, I know something in my head that I can easily just reach out to because I know this person is in my community and I know this person is looking for jobs. So it's easy for me to quickly think of some people, right? So that's like is, uh, one of the easiest options. First, be active, join one community and be active. So when I mean active, you don't have to just be making about as much as possible, just make your presence known in that community. You don't have to be a silent person, but just contribute to conversation, ask questions, and all of those things. So that's the first thing. Then the next thing is just keep applying. The third one is do what is called code email. I did that for somebody last month and she got a job. Um, what do you do? Reach out to head of data. Don't reach out to HR managers. Reach out to hiring managers, recruiters, people like Kyle Daily, people like Boss Patai. So you can just do it. That's why like getting your page job requires a lot of work. So you could actively tell yourself, oh, every day I want to apply to five, ten jobs every day. It's a lot, it's a numbers game. So just know that or getting that first job is a normal thing. So as part of the work might be, go on LinkedIn, search for head of data in any of the companies you are interested in, then pitch yourself to them. So pitching yourself would be, and that's where your portfolio comes in. You can't pitch to anybody when you don't even have a portfolio to reference, right? So tell them what you can do. Obviously, don't talk about money, talk about interest. Yes, it's a 50-50. Some it goes to you, not because they want to boost you. They have tons of messages in their DM, right? But as much as possible, trust me, the chances are somebody may read it and also respond. So leverage community after you already have portfolio, leverage community, leverage code email on LinkedIn or any of those platforms, and as much as possible, keep applying. I used to leverage uh, reference, I think it was Jessica. They said she applied to over 300 applications in the space of four months. 300 applications. And out of those 300 applications, she got 30 invites before finally getting three jobs. Now imagine if she only stopped at 10 applications and say, oh, I did 10 now and I'm done. So which is why, as long as it's your first job, you have to put in a lot of work. Be ready to build resilience towards what is called, what I used to call rejection love letter. I think it got to a point, rejection don't even get me any. Yeah. What I see, come, thank you. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I already know how it should be. <laughs> exactly. So now it doesn't get to me anyhow. So, Build that resilience towards rejection. So once you build that resilience, trust me, you will definitely land that first job. And the moment you land that first job, that's just it. Getting subsequent job become much easier. Okay. So let me just add uh, to it. So if you're looking for your first job, you have to be intentional. And uh, I see a lot of people dropping some. I'm a data analyst, this, this, I've never replied to any one of them. Guess the people I reply to. People, like when you guys post something, they ask me data, somebody go into comment section and make some contributions. Well, who is this person? I've called a couple of people. They're okay, yeah, they are intelligent. So what you always do is that, these guys, are, this guy has about 9,000 followers. He writes a lot, he writes a lot, I write a lot. So, which opportunity are you giving? Why would I go to inbox when I can get this guy? This guy's friend, this, all of us are linked together. Yeah, we follow each other on LinkedIn. So if this guy posts something, and I feel like, okay, there's, a, uh, there's a something of quality, and I make that input. I see it, he sees it, I know who is this person? So you have to be intentional about who you follow on LinkedIn. And you have to be intentional about your comments. So if you are coming to me and telling me you're a data science analyst, so many people tell me they're a data analyst. What's the unique thing they're bringing? People, like I was telling people, you have to come with the mindset mentality of solving problems. You're a data analyst, you have this, you have this thing. What am I going to do with that? I've seen somebody pitch, I've called some people who are, who are ended up knowing uh, interviewing, but I just like 
So look, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. Is there any problem comforting the organization that won't resolve? I always laugh, like, okay, ask this person, I like the gold. I'm like, okay, you know what? Give me a minute, let me speak to you. He doesn't naturally ask the beat that was employee. But like I said, it becomes top of mind. So much about saying, look, are you looking for somebody of blue skill? Ask somebody who's training for the person has confidence. You see, again, be your marketing manager. Nobody's going to sell you. You are doing that can sell yourself. In those days when there was not the world like this, when I was looking for a job, I was intentional where I go. I was intentional about learning so many things that because what's going to make or buy you is one minute or two minutes. So when they say there's luck, it's when preparation meets opportunity. That's why they call it luck. You always have to be prepared. The last time I went to data I was I got to I I I mean I got to bring from data person to my team. They will lie or not. Pray for it. <laughs> from that so you are looking for your first job and you're busy sitting in the house watching Liverpool, Manchester United, and there's data conversation going on and you're not there. You have to spread your tentacles. Sure. If I'm looking for a job, I can also say like if I'm looking for a job and I come here and they'll be talking all along, the kind of questions that we have is kind of contribution. These three people will be like, who is that person? <laughs> Every opportunity is your marketing avenue. So you come here, you're sitting there like, what are they saying, what are they saying? These are potential employers or refer, people that can refer you. Sell yourself. Mm -hmm. Just to add on the side notes, speaking about data first, that's how I joined Sterling from data first. So, uh, a previous colleague introduced me to him, he asked me a question and I answered, and then he said, send your CV on LinkedIn, my DM on LinkedIn. I sent my CV, and I was going to speak on that day. I told him I'll speak, he comes to my session. <laughs> <laughs> that was the whole interview. Wow. So when I just got, I said, there's somebody that's breathing. I said, there's no interview. What I want him to come and do is teaching people already. So what's the interview? So that, yeah, so what's the interview? The HR guys were there, because I brought them. Come and listen to the person that I want to bring in. <laughs> so, what other interview? Once the time somebody is coming and managing the guy, he's already teaching people with DBT. So, what am I going to interview? Where are you from? What's your name? How do you do? What's your age? They have already done it. So, it was <laughs> seamless. <laughs> it was nine and four because it was very clean. It was nine and four that cost us five. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, sir. Um, any, 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 any question? Do you have a question? <laughs> if I have a question, okay, this data analysis and transition product management is the same. We will come there. <laughs> no, it's it's very important to come there. I think it's the same. It's, it's the same. same. Yeah. Um, so, Jose. Thank you. So, I want to ask Mr. Ayo. So, you said something about flight tricks and something that I have somehow experienced. So, how long does one need to stay before? HR or IM when you have to stop seeing that someone has been <laughs> I think you should have stayed in one place at least two years. Okay. Uh, but it also depends. So so you don't want I'll say two years. Two years. Yeah. Okay. Right I mean in my early part of the career, I don't know what it sounds to be it's telling back that I just got started. <laughs> you see the question about it is that I always tell it. I'm always deliberately selfish. Anywhere I go. So I'm telling you that because my career matters to me. If in my generation that is you entered in university as a small boy, you left as an adult. Then you understand. So when I first got my job, first I was already done. already I already you know, you know, when you went when you if, if you attended uni life and you like the very first school, give you a fake word, so you know, my money's on the street, I can't be. So I said, me, I can't work again. After wasting my time for like two or three years, I went to go and do masters. The first offer I said, no, I can't work in the bank. I can't be looking up the money. There's money on the street, I don't like that. So, what happened? Okay. So when reality sets in, I have to take the job that I refused three years ago at an entry level with a master's degree. So, and I said, I need to evaluate myself in the system. I will not allow an organization or a system to study my career. So constantly I'm always there. So if I feel that this environment cannot get me to where I am, I'll move to another place. And because I've only applied for one job, when I got into this, everybody's like, I'm going there for the for the So if you look at my career for the first two years, there's one back I spent three, six, three, five days 
And the reason why I stay for 365 days is that because at the end of the day, when you know the confirmation of your video, your big one, <laughs> so I can't use that money. So I will get for them. And the job of that pay me, for example. <laughs> so, and I got to, when I got to Sterling, that was the issue with Sterling. They said, they are quite risk. I said, what do you have to say about that? Well, if it depends on you, I will stay as long as you want me to stay. But I will not stay for staying for purposes. So the three panelists were saying they were going to recommend me. I said, no, I cannot commit to stay. I don't know. What if this environment is not for me? He said, what it does to me, what it does for me was that I have to tell them I'm not desperate. And I'll tell them this is the value I want to bring. And because I've worked across many brands, I am far more exposed than somebody who's sitting in one place. Again, staying or living is a function of what you've planned for yourself. I have to be growing and the guys don't have to be challenging me. You don't understand, it has to. I can't be, even if I give me money every day, and I'm not going, I'm not stay there. The bank that I left for 365 days was giving me a huge amount of money. I left that place to another bank that's paying me on a massive pay drop because that's where I'm supposed to be. That's where the best grades are. I don't want to collect the money I'm supposed to collect at the end of my career from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I knew that the, all these people in this bank, they're not going there. I went to a bank where they have the senior management, they have first class, 50 people have first class. They have said, this is where I want to be. Because that's where I'm, I have to expand my network. I had left when I was moving to my last place of my, uh, what's called, my, I had to go on the pay drop as much as five million dollars. Because I just felt this one, in next two years, I'll be out of market. I'll be on market again. Because mm -hmm. they just give me money and I'm not going, there's nothing. What I was doing there in a month is what I would do in three days, four days, where I used to come from. It was fine, I was nine, four, I was looking at a white guy, I can't remember that one. <laughs> I was not stressed, I didn't sweat, I didn't shout, I don't agree with anyone. My shoes, my jackets always, they even want me not to wear jackets anymore. Ah, I'm too serious. <laughs> <laughs> but after a while, when I hang out with my friends on Friday, I used to, I used to lead the conversation. I started struggling. Because here yeah, I am, people see me like one black Jesus. Oh yeah, it's come, it's come. And guys have moved away. I said, no, this is not where I want to be. And I moved back. And guess what? In one year, I crossed everybody. Because all of them are now stuck in that place because they price out of the market. That's what the things that God will do. Give you money that nobody can give you, uh, nobody can make you. The, and the black man mentality is that if I'm any ex million, I cannot have ex minus one again. They would rather stay there. So you're living to one place as to be along your career growth. Along, I always tell people, don't chase money. These people don't have anything that chase money. Build yourself when you come. Build yourself. <laughs> people give me, give me, give me, see, see, let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, I always tell my team member. What I always tell my team member is that at any point in time, do not let your growth be in somebody's hand. I always tell them, do not let your appraiser be in my hand. Maybe such a way that I will find it difficult for you. I find it difficult for myself not to give you your good. Like, ah, ah, why would you give that guy a good break now? There's somebody that works with me. I cannot, I will say that anybody that can sack, that means you're not working. You know, there's some people that you want to say, ah, ah, no, 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 this guy is good now. Ah, this guy that worked overnight. No, it's the other people. That's where you know you are relevant. I've seen in this guy, he knows there's one guy in my office that the other units were even sending a mail. That the guy must get a letter of recommendation from the job that he did for them. Would I not say that guy on the South Africa? When I say that build your skills first, money will come. It's the universal law. If money is your watchword, you never get it. I'm telling you, it, it may not make sense to you right now, but I'm telling you, that, that's why when you have to look at your peers, I always look at what is the unique thing above all of it. That's what she that's what he was explaining to you about being a salesperson. I always evaluate myself along all my peers in this data industry. I'm like, okay, what skills are they have that I don't have? What kind of skill can I use to chance these people? They know. I always say, what kind of skills do I use here? I'm like, look, I'm two days old, I always Python cobra language. I don't need nobody asking. So let me switch off to how to translate technology to business. And I'm, yeah, and I'm, yeah, because at the end of the day, when I talk, I don't talk technology. I talk business value of data. Data monetization, that's what I tell you. How you can use data to make money. 
and left those technical details. So all the other people who say that they want to build out DBT, so they, they continue to say you know, <laughs> Because I've, I've realized that you have to have that unit. And that's why, even if you are an entry level, I know you guys are the same level, always evaluate yourself that, okay, you know what? What can I do differently? When I, was, when I started my banking job, everybody was doing that kind. I know was not ready for me. I was going to do MBA. So by the time I was doing MBA, me, I left the whole operations for them. I went to strategy. As I was doing strategy, I went to project management, Prince 2. Everybody was listening to me. I had Prince 2 for When everybody joined them, I left them. I went to business analysis and the, uh, the process in engineering. Before they could get there, I always get. So I moved. I moved. 2008, I took a deliberate decision to leave where I was. Because I knew that this one was too die. This data that you're talking about that's not my but let me love it. It's a first mobile advantage. And that's why I'm sitting here today. Because okay, everybody knew that this guy has been there for long. Who says in the next one year I will not change my title? I said, you know what? I've done data in such a way that I'm quite hard to forget to. So because at the end of the day, I'm here, I need to just find another place. Because that's what I'm saying that the more you make yourself marketable, employable, that's where the money will come. I don't think anybody sitting here will apply for a job. So, so just to add, in addition to what you said, so from experience personally, which I agree with what uh, Didi said, as much as possible, two years, maybe more than a year at least. Yeah, more than a year, don't do six months. So, because when I left Kariwa, I did only four months, even though my four months was in part four, what I'm doing is still paying me. Now, when I started applying for jobs, as much as possible, yeah, the recruiters reach out to me, right, on the all of them. When I get to the interview, they always ask me, why do you do you did four months there, why? And in my head, I'm like, I got tired of answering that question. Yes, I had response. So in my head, I'm like, so now imagine if I leave my current for maybe six months. So that means every new role has to keep explaining why I did four months, why I did six months. I also told myself, as much as possible, I think let me just stay for a while before I start. So it's kind of, just like you said, kind of just putting in a position. Even if yes, you are good, they will keep haunting you if you are good, but you are just like a flight risk to sort um, when you jump around. So just at least stay a while. You can get away with less than two years if it is if the years span across uh, two different. So for example, December uh, you resume the job November 2021, and you left January 2023. Yeah. You can get away with it because people would quickly calculate that. <laughs> Wisdom, wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> because, and the reason I say that is because we said the advice is very good. I gave someone this advice. It was someone who wanted to just leave and wait this in And I said, no, wait, wait, you left late so 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 time. Wait till January this other time so that it will look like. Wow. Thank you so much. So I, I'm really sorry I can't take any more questions. Uh, uh, please ask about panelists, please. <laughs> So if you have personal questions, you can look up to them. Is it, is it, is it let me know events? Meet them, take your phone number, DM them, and we will answer your questions. Uh, for the other questions,